Hi, everybody. Welcome to your Wednesday call. Uh, this is a wide open call. This is our public call. This is the one that we talk about. Thank you, Terrell, for pointing out that ascertain is a great word. Um, I'm glad to see that I'm on point today on a Wednesday, considering I've been up since about 4.30. So I'm about five hours into my day of doing videos and edits. Uh, this is our open Wednesday call. I'm joined by our CEO, Derek Kelly. Good morning, Derek. I like putting him on the spot. He stepped away. I know. I like the pause. It's dramatic. I don't think he's coming back. He, and our, he's, he's in the boys' room. He could he's be. In the, he's in the little boys' room. I can't believe he walked out that quickly after doing in the house. I bet you went to get coffee. He's getting coffee. Uh, uh, no doubt in my mind, he's getting coffee, which makes it hilarious. And our chief operating officer, uh, Frederick Solomon. Fred, how are you? Good morning, Lee. How are you? I'm doing great. Good. Does anybody call you Frederick? Uh, Freddie. Yeah, I like Freddie. But it makes me think of HR Puff and stuff. Is that weird? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, the funny thing was, is I interviewed Marty Croft. I did, did a loan. Really? Yeah. I did a loan for him. Uh, he was buying a, a house for his girlfriend. And she was like 28 years old. Of course. Of course. And, of course. And, and it was Sid and Marty Croft. And they were puppeteers. And then they... They were the people who um, who started Donnie and Marie Osmond, yeah, believe it or not. They were. Yeah. I know so all they're... this. This is my childhood. And even, well, since I know your age and I know my age, I'm guessing you didn't do it in the 80s when it would have been appropriate for him to date a 28-year-old, which means he was well into his 70s with a 28-year-old girlfriend. And God bless him. God bless Bur him. They bought in Burbank. <laughs> <sighs> I don't know. I, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent because I'm recording. I, I don't know how you people date younger people. I, what do you talk about? <laughs> I can barely talk to people my own age without getting frustrated these days. Uh, if it's your first time on the call or first time watching the video, well, if you're watching the video, Daniela, our expert, has already chopped this up to make us all look like rock stars. For those of you that are live on the call, it's a very loose call. Uh, we talk openly we have had so many variable topics that you can't even imagine. Uh, you can ask any question you want about the world of distressed properties. Fred is an experienced uh, real estate professional as well as a loan broker. He's got tons and tons of experience. He has a radio show on KBC in Los Angeles. Uh, Derek is just an amazing coach in general and amazingly patient. He is all the patients that I'm not. And apparently as I've discovered several times over the past week. I am occasionally not patient, but I'm working on it. I have a good therapist. Uh, and so that catches you all up. I have been in the banking industry for over 35 plus years. I've worked with distressed properties on both sides. All I've ever worked on is distressed properties. The minute they miss a payment, 31 days at 5 p.m., they're 30 days late. From that moment, they're in default. And until the day it cures or title uh, transfers, they are in a defaulted state. We specialize in a defaulted state. So let's do a recap of yesterday. When we last left our heroes, we had gone through a CoreLogic report that had stressed that there's a 3% default rate. That's kind of a big deal in the United States, which also doesn't talk about the 1%, which would be about a million people, um, that have taken out forbearance agreements. My math is really simple. I'm doing one at one percent as one million, three percent as three million. Uh, the numbers are pretty close to that. They're probably a little bit higher, plus or minus, but I'm just rounding for the sake of discussion. Nobody, I think, here really cares if I go, it's 1.3 and 1.2 and 1.45. Like I used to know all those numbers, like. The number that I uh, used to keep rolling around in my head was prior to the pandemic, there were 1,346,000 1, people that were actively in some form of default. Currently, there's about, I don't know, like a buck 50, Fred. Like I, there seems to be nobody in default. And then we saw the numbers yesterday where it was 0.3, like they're only foreclosing on point. 3%. And they were so excited. 
Because guess what? That's down month over month and year over year. But the previous, we did this yesterday, the previous explains that, well, yeah, but 3% overall are extremely delinquent. Okay, so let's extrapolate. 3% of people with an active loan, I, you know, let's be realistic, 2.4, 2.5, somewhere between that and 3 million people, depending on what stages. And you're only dealing with 0.3% or some ghastly low number, which is month over month. And you're over, if, I, if I'm not adding enough, enough sarcasm in my voice, let me state it out loud for anybody not getting it on the call. That's sarcasm from me. Um, so month over month, year over year, yay, cheaper uh, or down or whatever. Um, and they're still in January, they had to actively refile. Those active refiles take approximately 90 days. God knows how long it takes a bank to process 3% of its files that are in default. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb that even with manpower and automation, it would take most of the month of January. And Terrell's a big fan of doing this with my, my world, right? Which is um, whether or not I hit every date that I've said. And Derek actually wanted me to go and pull video on this and do a Lee's Greatest Hits of dates that I got correctly, almost down to the week. I'm, I'm pretty accurate. So I'm going to extrapolate online for all of you. Uh, January 1st, they, well, you would wait till that Monday. Hold on. I got to look at it. Hold on. Uh, if I have to give an actual date on this topic, uh, that Monday would have been the third, Fred, when everybody got back to work because it takes a signature to activate that whole thing. Maybe they set it up before Christmas break, but I doubt that. So you're looking at a 90 day filing period because you run in generics. Uh, the third would be the carryover to the set. Okay. So that's assuming everything could be handled in that week. I think it would take till the first, which means everything, everything doesn't hit a 30 day window till March 31st, which means the first real wave of active 91 NODs. Uh, yes. Depending on your state, please don't send me your emails, please. Please, please. I've been watching Uncle Roger videos for those of you that are on YouTube. I feel like I should do at these moments like Banker Reacts video. Banker Reacts to somebody going, but that's not how my state works. <sighs> yes, I know. And it makes me sad that you don't think that I know that you're a list pendants or you're whatever. Yes, believe it or not, I generally know most of the foreclosure timelines. You have to work in generalities with the bank. So in this particular generality, it'll take you till about all of the month of January to get all that paperwork out with signatures. And so it's posting from there 90 days from the end of January, January, February, March. Holy crap, I'm actually off by a month. Um, 90 day post physically, the notice of default would be the 29th. Good Lord. You're not going to start seeing stuff until the end of April in here. This is where it gets serious. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident from about the 15th of April till about this. There's going to be, okay, so we've already had, for those of you who don't know, we've done this on other videos. We've had a, tell me if I'm wrong on my numbers, Fred, you have a good memory. It was a 360% increase in foreclosure activity as of the first of the year. Is that about what we quoted or something crazy? Um, the, the articles I've been reading is 57% um, uh, month over no, month because huh? we, we can't do year over year um, because, you know, last year they weren't foreclosing, obviously. Right. But uh, the month, it, and I can get the link off one of my. Yeah, no, um, you're, you're fine. I think I'm, I'm for positive, for positive, sure. We've posted it up and it's in one of the video. Um, my mistake was I didn't look at it for how long the actual records execution from January 3rd, right? So uh, let me turn this video. But it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, they're expecting February to double from January numbers, which will put us right back at the same numbers at January of 2020 before the pandemic started. 
but it's only going up from there. And I'll get I'll get the articles because I have the that information. Cool. I've already po- posted that on Facebook. So here's the weird fun fact for all of you, because we pull data and we send it to our advocates, right? Uh, all you have to do, and I'm going to say this to everybody, send an email to Derek at the beginning of the month and he will pull data for you. He's becoming quite good at it, actually, and very efficient. And um, they're crazy. They're like crazy outliers. Yeah, they're the Adam data report that we use just recently. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, the outlier to this is places like uh, Atlanta, like Georgia, like the state of Georgia. Like we're actively seeking agents in those metros. Phoenix Maricopa saw only 14 foreclosures filed yesterday. During the peak crash of 2008, we saw a thousand a month. All right, so here's a fun fact, Eric, about Phoenix. You should be keeping an eye on my videos and you would know this. Um, Phoenix is sort of the Miami of Arizona, if that makes sense. Like Phoenix right now is a little bit insulated. Uh, You still have a, so the metros that have high travel traffic or high visitor traffic are still desirable to BlackRock, to investors. Uh, So Orange County, parts of LA County, uh, San Diego County saw a 23% jump. Uh, Phoenix, not all of Phoenix, like saying Maricopa County, That's not really accurate because they're not really foreclosing yet in your market. You guys have a weirder thing going on in your state like we do in California. California, you can't actively start foreclosure activity until August. And yet we still have enough activity for the advocates we have to go out and meet with people and still be very successful. There are plenty of people who have missed payments. Um, It's just whether or not they start the process of foreclosure. Uh, Arizona, Las Vegas, And California all adopted this very bizarre step back crap, which um, I don't know what their point was. The rest of the country uh, couldn't start real activity until January 3rd out of fear of Biden reprisal. Uh, Eric Johnson, we're seeing a 2% population growth, so still heavy. Okay, so why are you on the call? It's weird. Like, clearly, you don't think that there's foreclosure activity. This is why I like oh. recording. No, I'm- he said he said there's 14 foreclosures yesterday. So if you take 13 times uh, 14 times 30, that's 420 uh, foreclosures a month where he's at in Maricopa. And he says during 2008, he saw a thousand a month. But- yes. OK, so OK, now I'm with you. I apologize. OK, so follow this, Eric. If we're going 400, like, let's just go with this crazy low number, right? That's so if they're saying that only 0.3% is on the market, can we extrapolate that the other way based on your math, Fred, and go, what is um, 99.7% more than that number? Do you have a calculator? That's a calculator number. Just go with 99% even. And that's what the real number is. So, so 99% of, well, there's only like 20 business days in a month. So my, right. my, my numbers were off. So okay. there's 14 a day happening in Maricopa times 20. That's uh, 280 foreclosures a month. So those are, you know, 28% what a lower, that's 28% of lower than what uh, back in 2008, according to Eric's number. So what was your nine? You said 99% of what number? Well, yeah, you- what they're saying is we're only seeing 0.3% foreclosure activity right now, right? So let's just take the core logic data that we talked about this week. I'm not using my numbers or some secret cabal. Let's just round it up. What's 100% more of that, Fred? Okay, so uh, the uh, right now we had 4,000. Let me get the exact in the in the. <laughs> No, I am have I, the number. Am I the only one who has this wrong in my mind? Well, so there were 4,784 U.S. properties that were foreclosed on in January of 2022. Right. They're predicting that number to double in February. So right. that's now that's we're the talking. next report, which would be in April. So there's always lag time. So, so we're. We're, we're talking, only seeing we're only seeing fourth quarter numbers right now where everybody went, oh, we over predicted the market's going flat. By the way, that's how screwed up this market is. Generally, fourth quarter numbers happen 
mid January, like at the worst February, we're getting, we're full quarters behind in market data. That's how bad this, like the market is for real estate. It's really crazy messed up right now. But this is from October of 2021 when they first started uh, allowing you to foreclose because there was the moratorium. So right. the, only, the only lenders that were foreclosing during COVID were the private money lenders. Right, right, right. And, and everybody had adopted the Wells Fargo stance of we're going to wait till January 3rd before starting our activity, which, by the way, in the summer when Wells Fargo cut off their equity lines and said, we're not going to start activity until January, CNBC, MSNBC, and as well as Fox all said, well, Wells Fargo is run by a bunch of idiots. They said it. I actually have video clips of actual TV co-hosts going, well, you know, they're a bad company. That You know, they're run by an idiot. By the way, when Zillow cut off their division in November, same house, uh, it's just a horribly run company. By the way, these are $8 billion, and in the case of Wells Fargo, I think $80 billion or a $100 billion company. Like, what are you talking about? These people are geniuses. Like, they saw where this was all going. They all jumped out of the market. But we all keep looking at this short-sighted market of, Supply and demand, 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 supply and demand. The markets are red hot right now. No shit, Sherlock. Sorry, Sally, but that's reality. Like I deal with it every day. And Eric, I'm not giving you a hard time. It, I, I actually like, I like good, good give and take. I'm totally down with it. I, <laughs> we had a guy He's here to learn. He's yeah. here to learn. He's just telling you what's going on in his area. No, no. And, and legitimately, Eric, if you ask me what are the hottest markets right now, where would like if I could buy a piece of property and know that it was going to appreciate over the next three quarters legitimately without batting an eye, I would pick. I'm afraid of Arizona. I got to be honest. I don't know what's going to happen there and why everybody jumped out and why CoreLogic is a uh, saying that your entire state is going to hit flat to depreciation. I'm not privy to those numbers to look at those waves. I've looked at Zillow's projection and it's obvious in their projection that Arizona's going in the wrong direction, but that's Zillow's point of view. Um, I don't believe that. I think Phoenix, I, and this is what's not being talked about. All right. 50 to 60% of this market is driven by investors. Okay, this that's the story. That's it. That's the end of the sentence. There's no debate for this. You guys can all tell me that there are real buyers. There are real buyers in Miami because they actually do studies on this stuff to see who's taking out a loan and who's coming in all cash that's an investor. And by and large, 50 to 60% of the activity in Phoenix, San Diego, Orange County, LA, San Francisco, Las Vegas, right? These real metros are driven by investors looking for Airbnbs and Verbos. I mean, th that's just the story of this drive up. And Zillow was the one leading this charge. Zillow got out. And this is why I'm frustrated. And by the way, this is something that comes up in my own personal therapy. I feel like I'm crazy trying to explain this to people because all I keep hearing back is supply and demand. It's red hot, it's red hot. You know what? It was red effing hot in 2006 too. And I saw the first short sale. I saw it, saw it happen in my bank. I was just there for a different job. And when it happened, I went, you need to hire different people. Like immediately, like you need asset managers. Like this is a collection division. You guys are ill-equipped to handle negotiations on this scale. You think there's gonna be more? And even they would say in meetings, let's do forbearance agreements. It's a short-term market. Everything will turn around. The market will start appreciating again. Nowhere in the history of real estate, once a slide starts to begin, does it ever just do a quick turnaround and go back up? We've had plateaus. Like in the late aughts, we had like this weird little plateau. I was a builder at that point, right? Where we were going up, you could project and go, yeah, this is what I'm going to make. I'm going to make 20 or 30% on my money for building this house. And then we went flat. I lost a couple of deals. I had a house here in San Diego, a couple of deals that I did in two, early 2000 because the market went dead flat and I couldn't project the value to build out these lots or do these deals. That's for real. That's a very real thing, right? Um, that's not this market. 
this market is artily, artificially, um, yeah, that was a tongue tie there, Terrell. I know you're going to love that one. Artificially increased by dropping the interest rate to, what, what, what was the lowest, Fred? Two point what percent? Six, two, five. Okay, that's half the market, right? And then you go into this weird supply and demand when COVID hits of people not wanting to sell anymore. And you can look on a chart and look at it historically where people just went, I'm not selling anymore. Like they just jumped out and we went to this crazy, there's only like four or 500,000 active deals in the United States. That's crazy. Like we went from doing a million and a half to 2 million transactions a year to like a quarter of that. Of course the prices are going to go up. That's because people are scared, period. We had a pandemic for two years and literally in May, we will be completely off COVID restrictions. Tours are back on. I got cruise ships leaving my port. Things are back to normal, whether or not people want to accept it, whether or not you want to wear a mask, whether or not you want to get vac vaccines, whether or not you believe Bill Gates is sticking a microchip in your arm. It's all over. We've moved on to war now. And war is going to scare the crap out of the investors. Okay, it is. How do I know this? Look in Russia. They're trying to get their cash out of the banks. They're crashing the Russian banking system by asking for their ru rubies or ruples or whatever the hell they, ru ruble. Is it the ruble, Fred? I don't know. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a ruble, which is now worth one half of a penny. Like they've literally, thank you, Eric, ruble which is now worth one half of a penny. Like they're collapsing their economy. And if you don't think when China has something collapse or you're talking major superpowers, major superpowers, or did you guys all sleep through 2007, eight, nine, and 10? Major economy collapses. Like we're looking at the beginning of an everything, everything collapse. And this isn't me just saying it because it's good for my business model. In fact, I'm not actually into it. I think that there is a, I can't believe how short-sighted everybody is because everybody keeps going, prices will go on forever because it's supply and demand, 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 supply and demand. All right, supply and demand people. If 6% of investors freak the F out and start selling properties, that's another million properties on the United States market. Now, I don't know a lot about supply and demand, obviously, Fred, because people explain it to me on a daily basis. And if you think I sound a little agitated on these topics, I did have therapy yesterday and it's still not helping. Uh, and by the way, my poor therapist had to listen to at least 20 minutes of me going, I feel crazy. I feel crazy. If a million properties came on, that's 6% of investors selling their properties right now. 6% because of instability from Bitcoin, instability from war, instability from oil prices. Instability makes people want their cash, 6%. It's 1 million properties back on the market. Now, we're approximately at four or 500,000 transactions going on in the United States right now. And um, again, Fred, you are the finance guy for the company. Would a million properties coming onto the market have an effect? On the real estate prices. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Um, now, so I, let me just see if I'm got these numbers correct here, Lee, because I want to make sure that we're giving out good. And and I know we both analyze this very carefully. So there's 148 million homes in the United States. I think I was reading uh, when we did the call yesterday that 110 million of them are actually um, being lived in. and uh, Yeah, right. And right. so- Owner-occupied. Owner-occupied is the term you used. And, and, then, and then out of the 100, 110, 51 million of them were owner-occupied and the other uh, 30 million were, were uh, uh, you know, investment properties or, or second homes or whatever. So we were just looking at the primary residence ones. And if you take 6% of 80 million, we're talking 4.8 million homes. Okay. That's, 
that's what my, I'm just correcting what, you know, just so that if. We yeah. And say, I look, I do this a lot. OK, so for those of you that are new on the call or new to watching this video or whatever it is, I round and I round <laughs> down when I come up with numbers. <laughs> yeah, I don't ever round up. Like if I started rounding up, I actually get faint. The numbers are bigger than 2007. Like nobody is addressing, nobody is addressing a couple of key factors, right? And uh, key factor number one, that's still not addressed. Okay. And to go back to, and I appreciate your, your input, Eric, don't stop typing and keep right on me. I'm, I'm actually digging it on some level. Um, let's talk about key factors. Key factor number one, when are we going to discuss this FICO thing? Like if you have millions of people who've missed payments and it's not being reported, um, Fred, you do loans for a living. I mean, do you question reports that you're getting back right now? Well, all I care is if the people qualify to be perfectly honest with you, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I want to get them qualified so they can save money. Cause that's what people want to do is they want to refi and save money. But the problem is, is that, you know, we have interest rates that are up one and a quarter percent from where they were four months ago. And the, they, the Fed has stopped buying treasuries. So they basically said, let the market go as it may. And the market went haywire. It, it, right. went, it went through the roof. From the last business day of December of last year, to the first business day of January, which I think was the third, interest rates changed a, a half a percent from one business day to the next, a half a percent. That's insane, like crazy insane. Now that we've had the war start, the interest rates came down a half a percent on Friday of last week. Now they're up a quarter percent. Uh, so the, the rates are so volatile right now. It's absolutely crazy what's going with, on with these rates. Okay. And then let's look at it from the origination side. Right. And there are people who report on that. I keep up on those companies as well in their reports, loan origination as of the first of the year, is it up or is it down? Um, oh, way down. Right. So let's go to the next step. There have been reports of banks actually laying off loan officers. Like uh, some, one of the advocates sent me a report where major banks are like laying off origination uh, groups. No crap. You go hire underwriters and turn them into asset managers because you're going to do debt collection. But that's neither here nor there. Those, these are very actual things that occur in this market. So to go back to Eric's point. I'm not disputing what's going on in the market right now. I'm not. And I have this top this topic with Jane, who's in South Florida all the time. Like there have always been locations in these markets that are just gold mine. Like South Florida, believe it or not, generally speaking, most of the activity are people in Miami looking for other houses. And that's why it is the strongest market in South Florida. Of all of these markets, South Florida is the, the, that, that area, that Miami Dade thing is so incredibly strong because it's people within that group buying and staying within that group. Out where Fred is, that's outside people coming in. Uh, Phoenix, outside people coming in. Austin is going to be a bloodbath. Like people have already moved on to Austin and they're picking other places because Austin got too far out of control and they're going to hurt. They're going to hurt before the end of the year. They're going to depreciate. There's no doubt in my mind about Austin uh, because they overpriced themselves. I think Vegas has room to continue to expand through this year before they see prices coming back down. And to talk about what Terrell wrote, yeah, it's affordability, right? Jobs have to match income for people who are local. And we're, okay, so we're not addressing FICO. We're not addressing, and these are not my numbers, the seven million people who have not paid their rent like 
that's no longer being discussed as of November. Like that just got a race. Like it didn't happen. And if you think that there are 7 million people who are just going to, yeah, I haven't paid for a couple of years, but I'm going to stay here. That's not a thing either. Like there's no way BlackRock or any of these consortiums are just going to go. That's cool. We'll just start over. I mean, maybe they have enough swagger as, as big a company as they are, but they're not Shearson Lehman or something where they can make a call to the president and, you owe us and write us a check for, I don't know what, a hundred million dollars worth of properties we have where people haven't paid us. That's not a thing right now. This isn't, BlackRock is not too big to fail. They've got no issue if they crash. This isn't an actual lending institution that has lobbyists. I don't believe that they do. I believe that they've been lobbying heavy with the banks because what they want are more properties out the back door. If anything, A company like BlackRock or these big consortiums that are buying on massive scales, okay, buying on massive scales and driving up the market, half the market, they're pushing for foreclosures. And if you don't believe that thing, you can't see the writing on the wall. For every single market, there is somebody ready to buy property out the back door. doesn't matter if it's a bad HELOC, a bad second, a bad third. And if you go back to when I started in 88, we had thirds and fourth position loans. I mean... (coughs) just crap. Um, I worked for Beneficial. My first job was a property management company for, that's what my father started me at doing prop. I was basically a asset manager, property manager doing um, Southern California. Uh, We covered all of the counties and um, I mean, horrible loans, horrible, horrible, horrible. Like you should fire the manager of that branch loans. Like because they had to hit their numbers. Everybody's about hitting their numbers and getting their bonuses. People who get paid by the hours don't care about the quality of the product they're actually putting out. So when I look at this objectively, we're not, those two factors by themselves make this a scary market. Core logic saying it's 3%. Why? I was just talking to Walker Whiteside, newest advocate started this week in New York. He's in the Bronx. I'm going to be doing the red program. Shout out to Walker. Um, They're predicting a 3% default rate in market number one. I'll say it again. All of you should really digest what I just said. Market number one is a 3% default rate. How is that not going to be on the media? How is that not going to influence the news about real estate? It's... This, these are very simple things with the way media runs the country. That's the truth. Um, it's the reason why we hammer on you guys to go and create your own content. Or if you can't, then join me and let me create your content for you, right? This week we're doing do nothing. And that's what's happening right now. People are doing nothing. And the reason they're doing nothing is because they're not scared. Why should they be scared? That's the truth. Why should they do anything? They've been, homeowners have been bailed out and they expect to get bailed out. You've got an FHFA program that has been rumored to be around. And by the way, only affects FHA loans, which were crap before the pandemic. Um, Wow, I really definitely had therapy yesterday, Fred. Like, I feel like I'm just getting it all out of my system right now, my frustration. Um, (laughs) It's true. And you think I'm joking. For those of you, like my regular students, you have to know, like, this is what I do every morning. I'm doing macroeconomics and going, it, for those that have seen um, The Big Short, that scene where they walk into uh, Moody's or Standards and Poor's and go, like, why are you still AAA rating the bonds? Like, this market's already crashed. Well, they'll go down the street. Right now, because the media won't talk about 7 million people being foreclosed upon, the FICO system not being on, uh, the supply chain issue, like there's so many little tiny things that are going on. Like the Fed barely gets mentioned, but we're in March. They're raising it this month. That's happening. Okay, they've made it very clear. Um, I believe it's the 15th, if I'm not wrong. Right, Fred? Oh, the FOMC meeting? Yeah. Uh, it's coming up. I don't know exactly what the dates are, but I know it's coming up in the, and I know that they're supposed to be, this is supposed to be the first time 
that they're going to be raising rates in 2022, and they're predicted to raise short-term interest rates four times in 2022. I, I did some research on some housing affordability numbers as well. And if you take a look at the chart that I just sent, uh, you can see over the last four to five months what's been going on with housing affordability since the interest rates have gone up. But the real time to look is right after uh, January 1st of 2022, because that was our first real big spike when the rates went up a half a percent. And now they're one and a quarter percent higher than what they were in October of last year. So you can take a look at that chart to see the, the big spike downwards as far as housing affordability. The lower the number, the lower, the less people that qualify for uh, a, a median price home in that area. So th that chart is provided there. I just found it for everybody. And Excellent. Let me see if I can knock down a few of these things that came in. Lori, 430, forbearance numbers are not included in these numbers. That is going to be a huge increase. Okay, let's just go with forbearance. There's a million. There's a, more, a million forbearances that people haven't paid back. That's a million people that should have their FICO score one day wake up, which they still haven't done, where they're going to drop God knows how many FICO points for being in default overnight. What do you mean we're in default? I, I You said it was on the back of my loan. You're in default, dumbass, for that number of payment. Like, they're going to... Whatever the number of payments you miss, they're going to put that on your credit. Like, there's no way they cannot not do that. Ooh, double negative, Terrell. You should be all over that one. That's a double negative. Uh, Tina Herman, did you do away with the postcards? I cannot find them with the new phone number in the follow-up. Uh, I have to go. I just got a call to show vacant land. She's leaving in the morning. Uh, no, but I will make sure to make updated postcards for those that want those in the system, even though I haven't seen any success with postcards. but. For those of you who dig it, I'm down. Uh, Laurie, 430, how many are in forbearance and what's the percentage of those uh, speak? So they did, a lot of them did catch up, but the last number, which again is still, nobody's talking this year, like this year's number. Like the first quarter is the one I'm interested in. I'm still watching fourth quarter numbers just being reported at the end of the first, like this is unheard of. For a guy like me that eats statistics like candy, to see it take a full quarter before the numbers catch up for the previous quarter, like you don't take 90 days to make a report. Like when you come back on January 3rd, you start crunching your numbers for the end of January for the previous quarter. Like you don't, you, you and I realize there's press time and everything else and what it takes to get it online, but everybody's a publicly traded company. Like I can't believe stockholders are tolerating this horse crap from some of these institutions. Uh, I, I would never have gotten away with it at all. Stephen Thompson headline on risk media war in Ukraine, not expected to hamper housing market. That's bullshit. It's not what I think I know. And I'll tell you why I know. Um, anything that creates uncertainty in, let's just talk 50% regular, regular humans wanting to buy or sell a house. Uncertainty cuts down historically the number of people. Now, when you're talking about this housing market, when you've only got four or 500,000 transactions, yeah, well, we're down by a million, million and a half properties. My question is what happens when a million, million and a half properties come back online? Is everybody going to sing the same song? Oh, we can absorb those in my market. We'll see, won't we? We certainly will see. And that's the game everybody's playing. In the next 90 days, you're going to see a large number of properties come online. There's no way around it. And that's why I'm frustrated. I'm just sitting around waiting for, you know, watching it happen. I'm agitated today, Fred, clearly. I'm having a thing. I'm, you know. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to everybody on the call. If it's your first time, like we, I've scared off at least a good five or six people. I'm sure. Um, Sally Lee, people can't pa uh, see past their nose, much less their face near the big picture. If you can stand back and see the large view uh, in real estate, I've, I've explained this right in real estate, the market in real estate is unlike any I've ever seen. And I have been doing it long enough to actually have enough feedback on this uh, topic. And 
my topic, uh, my feedback on this topic is nobody in real estate does anything until the guillotine drops and their heads cut off. And then they react to try to sew it back on. I, yes, I've changed the analogy since the broken foot. Uh, I like the broken foot one, but the guillotine seems a little bit better because this is 2006 all over again. Go online and watch people who are longtime real estate people going, yep, it's going to happen. And I'm already adjusting. I'm already adjusting to work with this new market. Like I'm not going to compete with the other agents over scraps. Uh, and, and I would say this to anyone, are you going out and putting up tags? Are you physically getting involved? Are you putting out content? Like, what are you doing to be a part of this market that's coming up? You don't have to believe it's happening. You just have to believe, let's go with an easy number. Prior to the pandemic, a million and a half people were actively in some form of foreclosure or default. We aren't anywhere near that number right now. And I know this from the people we have that are going out and tagging and putting content up. We're getting meetings. Now they're interesting meetings. They seem to be older people. They seem to be private lenders or third party servicers because the major lenders aren't here yet. But those like Terrell, um, Myra, people that are positioned already, Marvin, doing videos, that content's out there. Like that content's out there for them right now. Just take Jenna and Robert. Robert is tagging consistently 12 to 18 houses every single week and going on his meetings every single week. And he's built a client list. Are they all going to convert right now? He's got three listings. Seems to be successful to me. I don't, I, I, Jenna, I don't need to do a cash to math ratio, but um, let's just say that the system was five or $10,000 based on three listings. Is it worth it? I mean, and we don't do monthly. Like, Please, we're not even in the market yet. We're not even in the real market yet. And that's why I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated because I know this is all happening. And for those of you that aren't fundamentally making the changes, uh, by the way, Eric, did you schedule your one-on-one? <laughs> Sorry, taking care of housekeeping all at the same time. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm just... Yesterday, I got really frustrated because it is frustrating to me. It, 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 on some level, I can see it. And I know the, those of you in the program can see it. And um, I'm as frustrated as you. But I also know that a large number of you are not tagging. Oh, Don Betts. Don Betts is going to own Colorado. There's a link. If you're on this call and you want to join the program, Go on that link and you will get 2021 prices plus the South Park episode. Can't wait to see what NAR thinks about that. By the way, nobody reported that to NAR. Not one person told NAR, <laughs> which blows my mind. How, how, like their copyright division, shame on them. So Lee, I really think it's important to keep all of this in perspective because we don't want to go around being Debbie Downers. I'm not right? Debbie. I'm not Debbie Downer by any no, stretch no. of the imagination. My look, our mission here is to help a million homeowners, right? Right. And um, the reality is, what? Do you, and this is this week's topic for Red. I mean, this week's topic for Red is exactly kind of my frustration on it. But why should they do anything? Why should they? Why should they take action and get their equity out of their house? Right? What? Why should they? There is nothing that has put them in a position where they can't be empowered to believe that oh, the government will fix it or someone will give me a loan modification or I'll get another forbearance. Agreement. I saw this with uh, Sally's clients, right? Oh, no, it's our first time defaulting. No, you're on a loan mod and you missed a payment. Like, what a surprise. And then they disappear. That's it's not shocking to me that people behave that way. It's not. I, look, this is. At this point in my life, I am hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homeowners in on talking to people who've missed payments. And the one that still astounds me is do nothing. And the reason for that is an investor will come along and offer me money. A real estate agent may or may not come along and make me some kind of crazy deal that, or, or an attorney and they'll save my house or the bank will offer me something or the government will bail me out. When you're talking 
millions of people on that scale when most of you are chasing after, I'm going to say it again, 400,000 active transactions to be one end of it. There, are, I mean, the, the, the math on this makes from a marketing standpoint, like, why wouldn't you dive in? Why aren't you tagging? Why aren't you creating content? Why aren't you going out and using, you know, our front page method of being on the front page of home advocates and just walking and talking and meeting? Derek does it all the time. Like he comes back with, you'll never, you know, the hairdresser or somebody I met at the, like the haircutting place and they did a forbearance agreement. Did you get, like, you get their info? Yeah, of course I did. I'm like, it, it's not that hard, but you got to start having the conversations at some point. I think the point of today is from a marketing standpoint, you got to have those conversations at some point. Like this is overwhelming data. These aren't things I think, these are things I know. I've hit every single day. I'm telling you in the next 90 days, the numbers are going to jump so dramatically of the number of properties coming online, right? Either in default or God forbid, investors who have jumped out of Bitcoin think that oil's unstable or another veritable plethora of things that make investors do crazy stuff. And the, by the way, back to the war thing. The worst thing is creating instability in the stock market. And if you're an investor who's buying property or investing in the stock market, I, I don't want to break it to anybody. There's going to be a point where they're not into it. Uh, Monster alum included in the new red program. No, Vic. Um, red is, dude, it's a hundred bucks a week. But I'll tell you this, Vic, you sign up for the red program. It's a hundred dollars a week. Um, I'll upgrade you into the next system as well uh, as an alum, but it, it, red is red is a whole thing. Like red is like the thing that I'm probably going to die on doing red, but because I'm able to do it with Terrell and Sarah, like I have a good diverse group of agents in every single market that meet almost every single demographic. And I work so hard on pushing them forward and getting their content out. It's good for all of us. Um, you guys should all be very thankful when you come to the event at the end of March and meet people, you should thank them personally, legit, legit, thank them. They are pushing the product forward. Uh, uh, shout out to Myra. Like there is nothing more rewarding as a coach hearing me come back to me from somebody I just recently started to work with like Myra, like, come on, even I'm not immune to that stuff. It's awesome. It's awesome. Antonio. Oh my God. Terrell. Great debates. And now we're doing diversity with Steve Love and talking to investors and trying to get them involved. I'm talking to, uh, I don't know if uh, Lipovich is on the call. Yeah, Miles. Uh, I don't see Miles today, but Miles and his son, Alec. Alex Lipovich is a developer who builds stuff and they want to come in and be our own in-house investment group and be involved with us. Like this is all happening because we have a great mission and what we're doing. But I, I need you guys to start having real conversations that are in the coaching group. And for those of you that are on the outside looking in, if you don't take advantage of these prices, I got nothing for you later on. Nothing. I got nothing for you. Wow, that was Captain America. I'm surprised Derek didn't comment on that. Oh, no, what, what was it? Tony Stark. I got nothing for you, Cap. <laughs> So Lee, I got, um, I get this question asked at least once or twice a day. I don't know how other people get this question asked or not, but when I do my radio show, they ask this question all the time. Is this a good time to buy? And I think that you have to have such a good, well-polished answer when someone asks you this question so to the point that you can use that information to email out to your own and past previous clients. And I'll tell you how I answer the question. And, and it, it makes my phones ring at the radio station and it makes my phones ring when I send it out to my previous clients, which I have, 17,000 clients and I put it on my Facebook wall. So I'm going to, you know, I encourage people to 
become a friend of, with me on my Facebook wall, and you can see exactly how I answer this question. But the way I answer it is, I ask them, well, what do you think? That's the first question that I ask is, what do you think is going to happen? And I actually did a poll on my Facebook. I had 106 people respond or 106 comments. And there were some really smart people commenting that I've known for a long time. Uh, Bruce Norris's son, I don't know if you guys know yeah. who Bruce Norris is. Of but course. He's, his son, Aaron, responded. He's going through cancer. Uh, poor guy. Um, you know, I thought was he got a, through it. I thought he, he's in remission. Yeah, he did. He's in remission he right now, right? Yeah. Yes. I've been keeping up on it. But there's a lot of smart people. Robert Fergoso, there's a lot of smart people that responded. And I was just scratching my head on what everybody thought because everybody has a different thought. So that's the first thing I do is I ask them, well, what do you think? And then I ask them, you know, this is how I say it. Lee thinks a little differently. Lee thinks it's going to be a little faster and he may very well be right. I'm not here to criticize what someone thinks. I'm just here to listen to what they say. And, and I say, well, if you think it's coming down, how, uh, how far do you think it's going to come down and how long do you think it's going to take? Well, I just go back to the last major recession that we had in 2007, and I say to myself, well, you know, it's 2007 was the top of the market, obviously. That was the best. If you were to time the market, 2007 is when you would have wanted to sell. Yep. And, and 2009 or 10 is when you would have wanted to have bought. So it was a, it was a two to three year market when the, the the market started rebounding when interest rates dropped and that was in 2011 and 12 and then we got back up to 2007 prices here in california in 2013 so the attitude is own your home for seven years and whether it drops in value after you purchase the property or not it's going to be worth more than what you paid for it six or seven years later. And those are the stats. And you can go to 1990 when prices came down to 95 and then rebounded it by 97, 98. You can go to 2002 when we had the airplane hit, you know, God for, you know, when yeah. they, we had yeah. airplanes hit the New York buildings, you know, that caused a small little recession, very small one. But the last major one was 2007. So, so, so I asked the question, well, what do you think Then I say, if you're a cash buyer and you think the prices are going to drop, don't buy, just don't buy right now. Okay. Hold on to your money. That's why there's so many investors buying right now. And I can't believe they're paying cash. Uh, to me, that's the stupidest thing ever. Ever. Because ever. I, I, oh I my just, God. It's. Well, and I'm going to say this because I've interviewed so many investors. There is not one investor that I've ever interviewed when they talk about doing any kind of project where they talk about using their own money ever, ever, yeah. ever. I've never. And there are so many mom. This is so much like the late nineties where people were buying in Arizona in that weird. Yeah. It's accelerating there. And then we hit that weird flat spin in the early aughts where you know, the interest rates came back and they thought they were going to do these quick turnaround flips because they took out a second, third or HELOC. They didn't have HELOCs. They're second and third mortgages. And <sighs> there are people extended in this market. Um, I don't. Yeah, it's crazy. The investors, it's not institution. Institutional people can take the hit. Look at what Zillow did. They took the loss. They didn't even bat an eye on it. They saw their numbers. They jumped out was backed up by CoreLogic's numbers uh, last week when we reviewed it. They jumped out. They literally lost tens of millions of dollars. They had no issue. They let off staff. They, they did what a large company can do and absorb that hit without destroying the company. And they took the hit to their stock. They were prepared for it. But when you're talking mom and pop, people just looking to get in on the real estate market. And it's not the first time I've seen it. People taking out, you know, additional, you used to be able to take out second, third, like you can take out loans all the time. Countrywide used to make loans. For a fact, my mom, uh, 
was buying properties like insanely uh, for a period of time with Countrywide because they were giving unreal rates and all you had to say it was owner occupied. Like nobody backed it up. I think she was owner occupied on several properties. She asked me what I think. I said, I think you're committing loan fraud, but you know, that's on you. What do, what do you want me to tell you, mom? Um, and safely got in and out of these properties and everything was okay, but it was very commonplace. That's ultimately what led up to the Titan guidelines that we have to deal with today, which has now put a position for people to walk in with cash. And if I were an investor, I would remain optimistic that if I bought even at this price, can I rent it to match what I paid for it? I, I know it from the property we're currently in, paid for cash, turn around, refinanced, the rents uh, on the extra units on this property pay for that. Um, that's good investing. That You want the property to be paid for by the cash investment, the short-term cash investment let, let's talk about that just for a second. So let's say the rent's 4000 a month. Let's say you pay cat. This is the way these, uh, you know, uh, people that are in, uh, that are purchasing these properties, this is the sales pitch. The sales pitch is, okay, it rents for 4000 a month at 48000 a year, okay? That's the cash flow. Right. The, the purchase price is $1 million. That may be low, okay? But if you take $48,000, thousand dollars and you divide it by one million dollars that's a 4.8 percent cash on cash return right right that's what is being sold to hollywood they know rents are going up they know rents are going up because of inflation so so that 4.8 percent has upside the upside is higher rents okay so they're looking at this from a perspective of 4.8% guaranteed cash. Well, it's not a cash on cash return because there's property taxes and, and insurance and stuff like that. But whatever the cash on cash return is, let's call it 4%, whatever it is, okay? 4.4% 4 .4 cash on cash. Where can you get 4% today? You, can, you can't, you cannot, you can't. Yeah. Let's even say it's 3%. Where are you going to get a safe 3% that's collateralized by a piece of property? It's collateralized 3%. That's yeah. the difference here. We're talking about a collateralized investment. Now, let's talk about vacation rentals like my house. Okay. Um, my house has tripled in value. It was worth $400,000 in April of 2021. And as a fluke, um, Lori sent a a little thing uh, yep. and it was a, a little link and I was looking at it while uh, it was the uh, the Fannie Mae link that she did and I was looking at consumer sentiment and the uh, her, what what people thought about whether it was a good time to sell in April of 2021 and it was <laughs> basically everybody was wrong because in my particular, if you would have hold, held on to your property for the last 12 months, you would have gained another 20% in equity. So everybody was wrong back in April 2021, according to that study. But the point is, is that my particular home has tripled in value since April of 2021. And my particular goal was to turn it into an Airbnb. Now, my buddy right down the street from me, he just rented out his house for two nights for the first weekend of Coachella, four bedroom, three bath, you know, 2000 square foot home, beautiful home. He bought it for $360,000. He used to do all the vacation rentals for, uh, for Jeff Bezos and Lauren Sanchez. I'm sure you've heard of those two people. Sure. And he's a very, very cool guy. And he bought he bought it for three sixty three seventy in uh, September two thousand nineteen. He's making about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. He just rented out the property for the first weekend of Coachella for two nights, twenty one thousand dollars for two nights. Okay, that's how crazy the short term vacation rental market is out here. So I'm looking at going and saying, let's say I sell my home for a million bucks. It's probably going to sell for one point two. But let's just call it a million. 
if you're making $150,000 a year off of the rental income for the year, okay, hundred and that's and I'm estimating low. Yeah, very low. 150,000 on a million dollars is 15% cash on cash return. <laughs> so you compare that to what you can do by renting it out and it's more than triple that you would get by renting it out. Now, that's going to hurt the rental market because every home that's going up for sale in my neighborhood is being snatched up by short-term Airbnb people. So now the rental market for people wanting to actually rent houses, guess what? It's going to be really difficult to rent houses in Indio, California, because all the investors are coming in and they're buying those properties and turning them into Airbnbs. So it's going to hurt the rental market, which is going to cause rental prices to go up because there's not going to, have you tried to find a rental home? Try to find a rental home today. Good luck. It's ridiculous. Oh, it's, it's what, com- I know it's, for a fact it is. It's worse than buying a house. But renting a place is harder than buying a property right now. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And that only means that prices are going to go up. That's all it means. Yes, it does. Oh, I, this- and when I did the place that we currently hold the Hoffas at, um, and I don't know who told me it was a real estate agent. Well, they're like, well, you're unique. You got it below market value. Yeah, I did. That's why I signed a three-year lease. I knew where the market was going. I stole my house. Um, Like I literally stole this house. And I know for a fact, because the people in the back, this is a three unit. This is a main house. And then there's a stacked duplex in the back. And when they had the price listed, I signed a three-year lease on it. Like it's a dual zone. It meets all my requirements. I, it literally meets all my requirements. I wanted to work live loft because I work such insane hours. Um, I needed both. And when they gave me the price, I, I was recently telling an agent like at a, uh, like a networking event or something in the, well, it, you know, you're unique. You're, you're you. I said, no, it was what was listed when I found it. And I literally, whatever the person said, well, we want more of this and we want, you're going to work there. And how big a sign do you want on the front of it? Like all these crazy little things that I asked for. And I said, what do you want? And I said, yes. And I'll take a three-year lease just like that. Wasn't even a debate because I could see where this went even a year ago, a year ago, I went, Oh, I, I know what this thing's worth. And I'm watching the people in the back, literally having their rent raised, you know, 10, 15, 20% every chance that they can get out of those poor people in the back. And when you're talking about regular people in regular units who start at like 1500 a month, you know, to all of us, for me to say 160 bucks, doesn't seem like that big a deal. It kind of is when you're, you know, making 20, 30 bucks an hour, like a regular person, you know, we, we all live in this little galvanized, uh, not good word, Terrell, I realize Um, we live in a very, we live in a bubble. Like we don't, we're not looking at the, I can see the big picture. I had a talk with one of the neighbors and she was flipping out over a $160 increase per month. Like it literally changed Teflon. Thank you, Terrell. Um, it literally changed the dynamics of her life. Like I saw it on her as I talked to her, like it was that mind bending to watch an increase of 160 bucks. And my answer to her was, cause she, she's like, what about you? I said, I signed a three year lease. I knew that it was a good price because he bought it for like a million or whatever this thing, he, and it was a dump and he had to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars to get it to where it is right now. And it's nicer. Um, he also knew that I would make changes to this place. So he's kind of getting a freebie out of me, which is why I don't call him for plumber stuff. And I, I just do it. Um, I can see it. And then he turned around and he reappraised it after a few months of owning it. He got the loan and it's cash on cash. He's making 10%. He's making 10% on his money, Fred. Like that means he's paying the loan off and there's still a kickback coming to the company on top of it for management fees and everything else. Like he killed it in the transaction. This thing was a complete home run from an investment standpoint a year ago. 
because of the acceleration. Now, when the market depreciates, it won't here because they're building more condos down the street. Um, the, the people in this area are all flipping out about people now buying large lots and putting up massive condos along the San Diego coastline. And all of the people of us up here on the hill, uh, not me, although I do want to join the group just for my amusement, uh, it's destroying their skyline. So they're changing the value of the homes on this hillside. This property theoretically could lose value if somebody bought the lot just below us and decided to put up you know, a 30-story building. It's no longer an ocean view, just like that overnight. And that's happening in San Diego. So the people who own houses are kind of getting screwed and they're all starting to fight back about this uh, right now in San Diego. This is a real thing that's happening uh, on, I don't know what they call us, Knob Hill or Gold Hill. And I'm not joking. It's like Knob Hill or Golden Hill. Or, I, I keep saying we're little Italy adjacent, but um, and my point to all this is, why aren't we having these conversations? Like, why aren't we out on the streets talking to people? And having these conversations right now. Well, because everybody believes supply and demand and it's going through the yeah, then go chase expireds for God's sakes. I mean, seriously, just go join the pile and you know, go wait in a bush and tackle somebody after their listing expires and explain why your bottle of ketchup with your picture on it is more important. The fact that this South Park thing happened last week is still the most astonishing thing in my life. Like, I cannot even wrap my brain around how this is not a bigger deal than it actually is. Um, why do we focus on the home advocate name and the logo? And why am I so obsessed with it? Because nobody wants a realtor anymore. And, and if you can't see that future happening, the way they rolled over on the whole MLS thing and the DOJ breathing down their neck and disclosing sides of the transaction, like all these massive cases that just... How do you guys not see that NAR is actually going to go out of business at some point? Like NAR is so close to being a dumpster fire of, we just don't give a crap. We're just taking dollars from agents so that they have a little lapel pen. I mean, that's, if anybody can appropriately explain to me what function does NAR have in your life, right? Because nobody's living by the code of ethics. Nobody's, you know, living up to a higher standard. Nobody's I, why has why it got to be me? Why, why does it have to be home advocates? Why does it have to be Fred and Derek? And why do we have to like push everything to a higher standard so that all of you that are members or those of you thinking of joining have something you can actually stand on? It's not just so you have a cool logo shirt. Like this is the way the company really operates. That was impassioned. Was it good for you, Fred? Felt, felt impassioned. I liked it. Um, I, I also think that all this information should be used with, with uh, the intention to help people. And, and to me, if you would have sold your home in April of 2021, you would probably be kicking yourself that you didn't wait till today because the prices have come up another 20% on average. 23% in San Diego over the last right. year. Yeah. So, so now, I mean, how much higher, if you're a homeowner, do you want the prices to go up before you sell? You know, and the problem is, is that if you sell, can you find something to buy or find something to live in? Or even if you were going to sell and buy, because that's my predicament is I got to find something, you know, that, so I'm faced with that. But when homeowners are thinking about selling, this data is so useful for them to know that this is really an incredible tell. But the way that I'm a, a, a guy in my neighborhood is, oh, Fred, I'm going to lose. Like, I, will, I know the prices have gone up so much in our neighborhood, but I'm having the hell of a time trying to find something. And I said, don't worry, I'm going to get involved. You know, And then I gave him some ideas. Hey, if you're looking to rent, offer you the annual rent up front for the year because he's going to have some proceeds. So I said, take, you know, $40,000 or $36,000, whatever the rent is going to be per month. And just say, Hey, if I offer the entire rent for the year up front, 
will you offer me a discount of any kind? Yeah, right. And not only, not only that, will you offer me a discount, but it also puts you, it's like a cash offer on a house. It puts you to the top of the, to the, to the top of the, you know, list of people that are interested in renting because you're paying for the entire year up front. And at that point, literally, there's no credit check needed because the reason for credit is to see if you're going to pay. But if you pay for it up front, do you really need to check the credit? I guess so. If they stay there longer than a year and, and they want to renew the lease, then you'd probably want to check their credit at that time. But the point is, is that if you're selling and then going to rent something and you offer to pay the rent up front for the year, you have a better chance than ever at any of the other renters. And that's something that you can literally tell your, your sellers right now and say, hey, look, you know, it's a great time to sell. And if you're going to go rent something or going to go buy something, you're going to probably have enough equity to pay all cash, depending on what area you're moving to, if you're downsizing or whatever the case may be, because most people that are selling are going to downsize because their families are moving, you know, in our age group, you know, the kids are moving out of the house. So that's a great info to tell these people that are thinking about selling, hey, you have some options. Here's what I'm doing. And I'm literally doing it myself. And this is what I recommend to you. And then before you know it, you got a listing. And I just got one in my own neighborhood. And I said exactly those same things. And, and I'm getting a $1.4 million listing in my neighborhood that I didn't expect to get, but I got it. And it's yep. going to sell quick. It's going to sell quick. in two, two days. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what kind of conversations people are having to convert or even first you got to have conversations <laughs> first you need position first you need content first you i mean there's just so much to discuss here uh vic i sent you a link and a note follow that instruction that's a good deal fred howard how you're not scheduled there's a calendar link in there fred howard sign up for your one-on-one -on -one. i'm gonna do some housekeeping terrell is it okay if she's still here? Terrell, is 11 okay, Terrell? I'm slightly behind, obviously. Um, for your one-on-one. -on -one. Sarah's scheduled. Who else is here? Um, Nick or any of you people that are not a part of the program, most of you seem to be. Uh, Fabian is, I think, program Eve. I don't know if you're signed up yet. Um, there's only a couple of you that are not actually part of our coaching group on this call. But if you guys have any direct questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, Lori is 